For thousands of years, civilizations across the world have been captivated by the idea of mythical creatures. In ancient times, reports of dog-headed humans, headless men, and shapeshifters were common. More recently, entire fields of study have been dedicated to finding creatures that somehow always seem to evade capture, and yet are fully ingrained in their respective cultures. For many, though, the idea of a living plesiosaur population in Loch Ness or an extant group of large primates in the deep forests of America is far-fetched, to say the least. But if we were to set our skepticism aside, the central question surrounding cryptids like these changes from whether they might exist to how they might exist. This is precisely the question that the Cryptozoologicon seeks to answer, at least for a few of the thousands of cryptids currently recorded in one way or another. Co-authored by C.M. Kozman, Darren Nash, and John Conway, the Cryptozoologicon explores the history of nearly 30 of these mysterious creatures, and as a scientific exercise, how those creatures might have come to exist, however unlikely it may be. Now, we'll take a look at just a few of these creatures in a bit more detail and, using the Cryptozoologicon as our guide, observe them in their natural habitats across the globe. The start of our journey will take us across the Pacific to the thick jungles of New Guinea, where just about anything could be hiding. The evening was humid and sticky hot as most evenings in the jungle tend to be. Charles Miller dabbed a handkerchief to the back of his neck as he pressed through the thick foliage. Ahead, his Kiriri guides called out suddenly, motioning for Charles and his wife Leona to get down. Heart racing, Charles peered out from the thicket and into a swampy clearing. His eyes went wide. There, in between two plateaus, was the creature he thought could never exist. A few days prior, Leona had been observing the Kiriri women preparing a meal when a very unique tool caught her eye. Resembling a flattened elephant tusk, the tool was apparently the horn of a creature known locally as the Roe. According to the Kiriri, the Roe was a gigantic reptilian creature many meters in length that stalked the marshy areas just a few days' journey from their camp. When Charles heard this description, he was skeptical to say the least. Still, as an explorer, he simply couldn't resist the allure of the unknown. He convinced a group of tribesmen to take him to the creature. He brought his wife and a camera with him. Now, as he gazed at the enormous creature, he was overtaken by fear. With shaking hands, he raised his camera and began to record. The row itself was nearly 40 feet long. Most of its great length was its neck, which, as it stood on its shorter hind legs, extended high above the ground. Its mouth was beaked like a turtle's, and its back was studded with bony plates, much like a stegosaurus. As Charles watched, the row reared up several times before slithering back into the forest. This was the first sighting of a row to ever be documented by a westerner, and it was also the last. Though Charles Miller claimed to have recorded footage of the beast, neither video nor pictures were ever submitted for examination. Since that day in the late 1930s, skeptics have noted that Miller's description seems to be a cobbling together of various dinosaur-like descriptions and likely a fanciful tale made up to sell copies of his book. Others believe in the possibility that a long-necked dinosaur, perhaps a descendant of a sauropod, could live in the jungles of New Guinea. To the authors of the Cryptozoologicon, it does seem very unlikely that the Roe is a dinosaur. If it does exist, the logical conclusion to be drawn from its description is a giant terrestrial turtle, specifically an undiscovered species of tortoise. This classification makes sense. After all, besides fitting the scaly and beak-like features of the Roe, the Galapagos tortoise has an extraordinarily long neck too, but of course it's much smaller. The authors conclude that in the absence of any high-browsing herbivores in the region, the roe adapted to fill a niche elsewhere taken up by species like the giraffe. Essentially, the roe is a super-necked tortoise, able to increase its reach even further by standing and even walking bipedally. In closing, they propose naming the creature after its discoverer, Girafficellus malari. The year was 1995. The place? Puerto Rico. The still of a late March night was broken by the shrieks of livestock. A local farmer awakened with a start and ran out to the pasture that housed his sheep. What he found there chilled him to the core. Eight of his sheep lay dead, each with three puncture wounds in their chests. Even more disturbing, though, was that they had been entirely drained of blood. In August of that same year, and not far from that farm, a woman named Madeline Tolentino was passing by a window in her home. Her eyes caught a glimpse of something glinting in the moonlight. She stopped and peered outside, and recoiled in horror. A creature with shiny reptilian skin hopped across her yard like a kangaroo on its rear legs. Its eyes were blacker than the night and long, sharp-looking spines ran down the length of its back. As she watched, unable to look away, she was suddenly overcome by the scent of sulfur. There was little doubt in Madeline's mind that this was the creature responsible for the livestock attacks that had been plaguing the area for months. This creature would later come to be known as the Chupacabra. Madeline's description was the first to come from an eyewitness account, but as a whole, descriptions of the chupacabra vary greatly. While some agree with a bipedal reptilian form, others describe a winged bat-like creature. 
Still others think of it as a mammalian canine of some kind. But in nearly all cases, the chupacabra is known to hunt under the cover of night using sharp teeth to drain its prey, usually livestock, of all its blood. This is why in some regions it's also known as the Mexican goat sucker. Explanations for the chupacabra phenomenon range from outright hoaxes to aliens to simply an unknown, though very real, animal. If it is a creature so far unknown to science, the authors of the Cryptozoologicon have a few hypothetical possibilities. Linking all of the accounts together, it seems most likely that the chupacabra is a semi-bipedal, nocturnal, predatory marsupial. It would have a long, robust tail and forelimbs similar to a primate's. It would be able to leap and climb much like certain marsupials in Australia, but is most similar to a very large opossum. The opossum's dentition is already nearly ideal for a large-bodied predator with large, sharp teeth and strong jaws. Its intimidating features, combined with dark fur and forward-facing eyes, make the newly named Dinaru caprophagus a truly formidable predator. While this new look at the chupacabra might make it less mysterious, it certainly is no less terrifying, especially if you own livestock. But while protecting yourself from blood-sucking predators that prowl the night is important, your virtual safety is just as vital. In fact, I cannot stress enough just how important it is to protect yourself from all the online malware that bombards us every day. It's even more important with the rise of digital currency and malicious ads. That's why I'm super excited to talk to you today about NordVPN, a truly phenomenal privacy and cybersecurity software that I actually use every single day on my computer, tablet, and phone. By creating a secure tunnel for all your browsing data, it conceals your IP address, location, and shields your data from snoopers, even while connected to public Wi-Fi. Personally, as someone who uses coffee shops and school Wi-Fi often, I can't tell you how valuable it is to have peace of mind while I'm not on my home network. Plus, even when you are at home, NordVPN identifies malware-ridden files and can even stop you from landing on malicious websites in real time, even when you're not connected to a VPN server. And when it's time to relax, I use NordVPN to unlock streaming content not available in my country. Just the other day, I wanted to watch a movie about the Missouri equivalent of a Sasquatch, but it wasn't available in the US. But you know where it was available? That's right, Canada. Just a couple clicks into NordVPN and boom, Amazon thinks I live north of the border. As I mentioned before, I use NordVPN on all my devices, and you can too. Up to six devices per account. It's also super easy to use, I just toggle it on and let it automatically protect me whenever I connect to a new network. So if you're ready to protect your online presence and make yourself invisible to invasive trackers, head over to nordvpn.com slash thoughtpotato today for an exclusive discount, or click the link in the description. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no reason not to see for yourself just how easy and effective it really is. Now, let's return to our catalog of mysterious creatures, starting with a certain, very famous ape. The legend of Bigfoot needs no introduction. Arguably the most popular cryptid of the modern era, Sasquatch has been the subject of books, films, television shows, and of course, countless hoaxes. But the legend of Sasquatch goes back for centuries. On the Tule River Indian Reservation in Central California, for example, petroglyphs created by a tribe of Yokuts are alleged by some to depict a group of Bigfoot called the Family. These glyphs are estimated to be nearly 1,000 years old. But it was the mid-20th century that saw Bigfoot enter the public awareness. In the 1950s, loggers began to find enormous human-like footprints in the muddy backcountry. Coincidentally, this is how Bigfoot got its name. In 1967, the most famous and controversial evidence of Bigfoot's existence came in the form of a short film taken in Northern California by two men by the names of Gimlin and Patterson. Though groundbreaking, the validity of this film has been debated for decades. Unlike the Chupacabra, and partially thanks to the Patterson film, we have a very clear and consistent image of what Sasquatch is alleged to look like. A dark-furred hominid that combines features expected in a giant gorilla-like herbivore with the more human-like aspects reported by witnesses. Overall, Bigfoot is remarkably human-like in such details as breast form, nose anatomy, and in its bipedal striding gait. For these reasons and others, some experts have concluded that Bigfoot is a close relative of humans. To take it a step further, alleged Bigfoot handprints seem to indicate human-like hands, though less suited for opposability as that of the human thumb. But of course, there are some major differences to Homo sapiens beyond the obvious. Evidenced by the Patterson film, the knee is apparently kept slightly bent throughout the walk cycle, and the foot seems more flexible than that present in humans. This could mean that Bigfoot is more likely another sort of hominid that is only convergently human-like. In fact, anthropologist Grover Krantz argued that Bigfoot is most likely a new species of the fossil hominid Gigantopithecus, specifically descended from Gigantopithecus blackii, which may have crossed over from Asia via the Bering Land Bridge thousands of years ago. Krantz even proposed a name for this new primate, Gigantopithecus canadensis. 
The authors of the Cryptozoologicon agree, and state that indeed, perhaps G. canadensis is a member of the Pongine family, which also includes orangutans. Is it possible that an as-yet undiscovered relative of orangutans roams the wilderness of North America? Well, if any one of the hundreds of annual sightings are to be believed, the answer is a resounding maybe. The deep, murky waters of Loch Ness conceal countless mysteries. Of course, this lake has been the subject of intense observation over the past few decades, as its main attraction, the Loch Ness Monster, continues to evade capture. But little known to most people is that Loch Ness is home to another, perhaps even more terrifying monster. It was the legends of this monster that kept children away from the water's edge for fear of being lured, drowned, and eaten. But adults weren't safe either. This monster was said to be able to shapeshift, taking the form of a beautiful young man or woman, only to ensnare their hapless victims before dragging them to the depths. Most often though, this so-called Kelpie took the form of a horse, a stunning animal in every way, except that its mane constantly appeared dripping wet even when it was far from the water. Children in particular were susceptible to the Kelpie's invitation to hop on its back for a ride. Once there, the poor child found themselves stuck, unable to wriggle free as the horse spirit returned to the deep waters. Though the legend of this water horse is most commonly centered around Loch Ness, in reality, almost every sizable body of water in Scotland has an associated Kelpie story. Though the idea of a shape-shifting horse spirit seems fanciful, the authors of the Cryptozoologicon are ever intent on finding any scientific means for its existence. It's a tall order, to be sure. There are no amphibious horses, after all. But though the idea of a terrestrial quadruped entering the water for extended periods of time might seem strange, the truth is that many modern hoofed animals do something very similar. Perhaps the most surprising of these is the African water chevrotain Hyamoscus aquaticus, which often entirely submerges itself into bodies of water, even while walking along the bottom for extended periods of time. With tongue admittedly in cheek, the authors propose that kelpies are actually giant, especially robust amphibious relatives of chevrotains, adapted for cool northern climates and possessing thick, luxuriant manes and tails that make them look superficially horse-like from a distance. They go on to say that an oily, dense, velvety pelt insulates the kelpie during its aquatic forays but has a sticky feel, and it is clearly this characteristic which has given rise to the idea that kelpies are adhesive. The authors dub the kelpie Sarcomoscus borealis and point out that chevrotains are even known to eat small animals like frogs and birds, which could have certainly given rise to the kelpie's legend as a carnivore. A larger relative, as the kelpie most certainly is, would likely have teeth large enough to tackle larger prey, including the occasional human and so the legend came to be. It may not explain the Kelpie's alleged ability to shapeshift, but sometimes even cryptid science reaches a limit. Imagine, if you will, that you're walking down a grassy path that cuts through a beautiful open meadow. The sun is shining and the songs of birds fill the air. Suddenly, from the tree line to your right, a large wheel comes barreling toward you, plowing down the foliage in front of it. Too startled to move, you look closer at the wheel as it rolls and realize that it's not a wheel at all, but a living creature, a snake no less, grasping its tail in its mouth and forming a large, terrifyingly locomotive hoop. Suddenly, it's upon you and it strikes. In the blink of an eye, it straightens its body, using its momentum to fly towards you tail first, where a large stinger glistens with dripping venom. In an instant, you know that if this stinger hits you, you'll be dead before you hit the ground. And you, my friend, would be very right. Of course, if you'd done your homework before entering the hoop snake's habitat, you might have taken greater care. One of the earliest accounts of this terrifying creature comes from a letter dating all the way back to 1784. As other serpents crawl upon their bellies, so can this, but he also has another method of moving peculiar to his own species, which he always adopts when he is in eager pursuit of his prey. He throws himself into a circle, running rapidly around, advancing like a hoop, with its tail arising and pointed forward in the circle, by which he is always in the ready position of striking. From the above circumstance, peculiar to themselves, they have also derived the appellation of hoop snakes. Odd as it may sound, in the animal kingdom, creatures that curl into a ball and roll downhill do exist. Granted, these creatures usually do this by simply folding their limbs and letting gravity do the work, rather than forming a hoop. But as the authors of the Cryptozoologicon point out, at least there's a precedent. The hoop snake is very unique, though, in that it possesses a stinger-like organ at the tip of its tail, which it uses for both attack and defense. Could a real, biological creature actually come to exhibit this bizarre anatomy? Well, the Cryptozoologicon's hypothetical snake has a heavily keratinized inner mouth, perfectly shaped to receive the sharp end of the caudal stinger. For further protection, the back of the mouth is sealed by a thick, keratinous flap. Since wild hoop snakes are so difficult to observe in detail thanks to their extremely odd form of locomotion, it isn't clear whether the reports of venom in its tail can be believed. It seems most likely that the tail terminates in a simple sharp spine of some kind, though of course nothing can be ruled out. 
One thing is for sure, though, if you see a slender, scaly hoop bursting toward you, do yourself a favor and run. The creatures we've discussed so far have varying degrees of believability, to put it lightly. But there is one thing most cryptids have in common. They live on the Earth, in a plane of existence we can understand. This might not be the case, however, for a group of mysterious creatures known as flying rods, or skyfish. These atmospheric beasts first began appearing with the advent of interlaced video. They would appear in the video recording as an elongated shape, often with fins that run the length of its body. Alarmingly, these flying rods are fast, zooming across the sky at speeds estimated to be in the hundreds of miles per hour. In the late 1990s, when these creatures entered public awareness, people who saw these anomalies were stunned. What were these creatures that were invisible to the naked eye, but seemed to pop up relatively often in video? Were they some kind of interdimensional being able to blink in and out of our reality at will? Or maybe some kind of advanced technology that moved too fast for the human eye alone to detect? Well, as it turned out, these flying rods are nothing more than an optical illusion created by motion blur. Essentially, they occur when a video captures multiple wing beats of a bird or insect within a single frame, making it appear elongated. It also often makes it appear to be moving at lightning speed. But, as with most cryptozoological mysteries, the simplest explanation is not the most interesting one. The authors of the Cryptozoologicon dare to ask the question, what if skyfish were real? The idea of a living, lighter-than-air creature is an interesting one, to be sure. Most commonly, these rods are reported to be around 60 centimeters in length and can be found in atmospheres all around the globe. For camouflage, these creatures would possess pale, translucent tissue, which would make them nearly invisible to the casual observer. Most likely, the skyfish are descended from the Dinocarididans, a successful group of Cambrian predators, the most famous example being Anomalocaris. All it took was for one Dinocarididian lineage to adapt to dwelling in surface waters. Eventually, its heavily keratinized body armor disappeared, allowing it to briefly drift along ocean breezes and absorb nutritious chemical froth found on the ocean's surface. Over time, these Volocarididans became even more specialized, adapting to a fully aerial lifestyle. Able to obtain moisture and nutrients from the air through their skin, they no longer needed a mouth or a gut. But though this accounts for the majority of air rod physiology, it can't explain the so-called megarods, abnormally large skyfish that are sometimes captured on film. It's most likely that these megarods live concealed in the upper atmosphere for most of their lives, and they're the only rods capable of reproducing. These megarods are typically 30 meters long and, like their smaller offspring, are semi-translucent. Though their population is undoubtedly small, a collision with an aircraft is likely only a matter of time. As we've seen, there's almost always some truth to every legend, no matter how fanciful that legend might be. No matter what your opinion on cryptozoological creatures is, they'll always serve a purpose beyond simple entertainment. They serve to rekindle our fascination with the creatures we know exist or have existed in the past. An exercise in scientific study like the Cryptozoologicon is a great read because it grounds fantasy and reality in new and interesting ways. So in case I haven't talked it up enough, you should definitely check it out via the links in the description. And again, a huge thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Be sure to check out their links in the description as well. And if you can't get enough of these mysterious creatures, be sure to check out this video. And as always, thanks for watching, and remember, you matter.